morning. Well, welcome back to uh, those who've been at Great Decisions before. Welcome to those of you if this is your first time here. Uh, my name is Rick Kilroy. I teach in the Department of Politics here at Coastal Carolina University. And I'm excited that this is our fifth year uh, hosting the Great Decisions program. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the program, it is a flagship program of the Foreign Policy Association. And they've been putting it on for uh, over 60 years now. And it's run all over the country. Um, what we do is we pick four of the eight topics that the Foreign Policy Association selects. Uh, and we usually kind of look at, you know, what topics we can cover here with faculty here at Coastal. Uh, and then also go out and see what uh, faculty are able to come, uh, or subject matter experts or practitioners who can come support. Uh, the other topics. We're really excited this year because we're actually bringing in three guest speakers. Uh, in the past, we typically brought in one. Uh, this year, we bring in three guest speakers. So we're really excited to be able to do that uh, to support the, uh, the topics that we're doing this year. Um, I, I want to let you know that this is really a collaborative effort. I mean, we're hosting here at Coastal Carolina University, but it is a part of many different uh, people who are very much a part of that. Uh, and what I'd like to do is go ahead and introduce some of the people who helped make this possible. Uh, first off, I just want to thank Dean Ennis of the uh, College of uh, Humanities and Fine Arts. Uh, they're, they've been the main sponsor for our program. Uh, this is actually Dean Ennis's last year as Dean, so uh, we're hoping that uh, whoever replaces him will be as supportive as he has been in the past. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that works. Um, but he is the, uh, the uh, Vice President for Academic Outreach, and so he was very supportive of the, uh, what the program's been for community outreach in our area. Uh, I'd like to also introduce other sponsors of it and have them come up and welcome you and say a few remarks about their organizations. So first I'd like to introduce Darla Damke Damonte, the Associate Provost for Global In Initiatives uh, and part of the Center for Global Engagement that also supports our program. Darla. Good morning everyone. It is such a pleasure to have this program beginning again. I can't tell you how important it is for us to help each other better understand the things we're seeing in the news, the things that we think we understand, um, and to reach those uh, conclusions and draw better conclusions, if you will, about how we enact in the global uh, world around us um, through the input of experts like Dr. Murphy today and those who are coming in the coming weeks. Um, the Center for Global Engagement uh, helps to advance a global perspective and global awareness on and about our campus community. We support study abroad, education abroad initiatives. The university calls for doubling those uh, numbers over these, these years coming up, as well as advancing our international student and scholar engagement um, and creating and supporting programming like this that help to bring conversations that need to happen to our community. So we are delighted to be um, involved and included in this. But quite honestly, Rick and Jacqueline really do all of the work, and, when, and we just help with that and say that is absolutely square in our box of what we'd like to see happen. So thank you all for being here, um, and please help us know other ways we can help to continue advancing global awareness and conversations that need to happen. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jacqueline Kurlowski. Jacqueline is the uh, director of the Edgar Dower Institute for Leadership and Public Policy. And Jacqueline also teaches courses for us on public policy in the Department of Politics. Jacqueline. Hi, good morning. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces again this year. Um, a heartfelt welcome to each of you to our coastal campus. As the director of the Dyer Institute for Leadership and Public Policy, we are all about examining and unpacking real world problems to find meaningful solutions. We offer a lot of different opportunities to be involved in the community and also a really robust um, fellowship program for our students. So your support of these programs and your general support of the university are uh, greatly appreciated. So thank you for being here with us this morning. Okay, a couple, just a couple of logistics things. Think, as you probably noticed, things did change this year. Um, we do not provide the, uh, unfortunately, we're not providing the food this morning. Um, the decision was made that that money could be used to help uh, support bringing in additional guest speakers, so that's what we did. Uh, there is coffee available. Uh, you're welcome to that memory. We do ask you again not to bring in any uncovered cups and things into the auditorium, so, so please make sure that you don't do that. Um, the other thing is uh, Barnes & Noble did take over the book sales this year. Uh, we, in the past, we've been able to offer them to you basically at cost. 
Uh, they did increase the price this year, and then Barnes & Noble took over the sale, so that did precipitate a change in price on the books. But we do encourage you, if you'd like to purchase one, they are available uh, on the table outside. And, and the books, uh, they are well done. Uh, they have articles for all eight of the topics, not just the four we're doing. And what we do for you each week is we have one of our students summarize uh, the article that's going to be discussed. And uh, I was very fortunate that uh, I do have one student taking my uh, Great Decisions course this semester, and uh, she did the uh, summary of the article for you on that paper. And I'm going to invite her up now to also introduce our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Audrey Owen is uh, a junior uh, intelligence and natural security studies major here at Coastal Carolina University, and she's also mining in, minoring in global studies. Audrey. violently seesawed between 
nearly 20% per annum growth, crashing back down then to, in, depending on your measure, actually in a recession year by year. Since then, China has tried to moderate this, and as you see, naturally there has been a decline in the average growth rate per annum in China, which is both to be expected, as the economy grows, it becomes mathematically impossible to continue to grow at 10%, 15% per year, because the amount of imports that would be required to sustain that level of growth would actually become self-consuming growth. So you can't actually grow that fast. But suffice to say, overall, the economy has grown nicely. And today, China, this, uh, in 2017, looks like it would have hit, or 2018, sorry, should have hit somewhere in the vicinity of about 6%, which, interestingly enough, is exactly the amount they said that they wanted to hit for economic growth. The article mentions that the numbers in China are perhaps made up. But then there's always there's actually an old joke among economists that what, what is the similarity between Wall Street and Goss Plan? Goss Plan, for those who remember, was the old Soviet planning agency. Why is Wall Street like Goss Plan? They both make up their numbers. So it's not a China phenomenon. Exports, as we all know, China is a massive export engine. Indeed, for the last 30 years, China's <coughs> level of exports <coughs> as a percentage of GDP has been akin to what you see in oil exporting countries. So for a manufacturing power, their level of exports is very, very high. And this is part of the reason why. Again, violent seesawing, but these are the rates of increase in exports year on year. So it's not the level of exports, but how fast they are growing. Of course, you can see the financial crisis that year, exports actually declined by about 20%. What's even more shocking is that that 20% decline occurred in the last three months of that year. So if you, went, if you were in China in 2007, like I was, and in 2008, the first half of 2008, everything was fine. Every factory was humming, orders were good. And then in August, across the southern delta, the region of China that I study, the phone started ringing. And people would say, cancel that order, cancel that order, cancel that order, cancel that order. In the space of three months, over 3,000 factories in one city alone went bankrupt as a result of the decline in overseas borders. So China has had this experience. And today, you'll notice that after a bit of a dip in 2011, China's exports are still actually increasing year on year. And as the article mentioned, actually, even with the tariff amounts that we are placing against China, Scholars are estimating that this will only affect the growth rate of Chinese exports. It will not actually reduce their export volume, but might make them go from, instead of 8% more exports this year, they might only have 7% higher exports this year. So some of U.S. trade, the question in which we are all interested in. This is the chart we all know, which shows blue line, China's export to the United States, orange line, U.S. exports to China. What do you see? Well, obviously China is selling much more into the United States than they are purchasing from the United States by the order of about $350 billion per annum. Couple of problems with this chart. Number one, as the article mentioned, this is based on the final price of the good exported. So the classic example, the wholesale price of my iPhone is about $285. So every time Foxconn, the manufacturer in China, ships an iPhone to the United States, we add $285 to this export bill. Never mind the fact that China only actually added about $15 of value to that iPhone. So even though from the US, their purchases of goods are fairly limited, their total imports necessary to make that iPhone amount to $270. Translation, China only made $15, or a fraction of what they're actually given credit for. Further, and I looked for these statistics, it's very hard to get accurate counts of the value of services that the United States exports to China. Financial services, as well as then Chinese tourists come to the United States, Chinese students coming here to study. These are also a form of US exports that this chart does not take into consideration. So when you hear these numbers, take them with a very large grain of salt. Similarly, the other thing we need to keep in mind is this blue line again, China exports, orange line, China imports, 
Then we have these gray and yellow lines. The gray line is our imports from the rest of Asia. And then also similarly, the yellow line are our exports to Asia. Going all the way back, and I have the data back to 1992, but you can trace it back to the 1970s. The US has consistently imported more goods from other countries than it exports in terms of goods. A couple of reasons for this. One, again, we are an advanced industrial economy. We specialize in services. So we sell more services to these economies than we sell them goods. Further, unlike China and many of the other East Asian exporting economies, we consume most of what we produce. So US manufacturing, yes, we may not be selling as much to these other countries, but that's not the point. The fact is the factories here are making things that are sold and consumed domestically in the United States. So in some ways, although this chart doesn't quite show the effect, what you actually see in this fact that the gray line, that's our imports from the rest of Asia, is fairly stable over time. <laughs> it's because many of the factories that were once in other parts of Asia have actually moved to China. So effectively transferring their trade surpluses to China without actually changing the overall US trade situation. So what has been the impact of all of this trade on the United States? Number one, and this is one that for those of us who like to buy things, on my house, I bought one a few years ago, suppression of inflation. The fact that China is bringing in all of this hard currency has presented a very severe problem <coughs> with China. Hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of foreign exchange coming into the Chinese national coffers would induce inflation in China. It would raise the value of the Chinese currency. As we all know, a higher currency value would decrease their export competitiveness. So how do we hold down the value of the currency? Well, we need to get rid of those dollars. <coughs> well, you can't spend a dollar in China. Their currency is the NMB. So how do you get rid of dollars? You have to buy something. So you buy US Treasury instruments. So the fact that China continually buys US securities, specifically Treasury bonds, has held down inflation rates in the United States by helping to keep our interest rates low. On average, we've also been able to suppress, because of the cheap price of that, overall inflation by about 1 to 1.5% per year. Translation, the average family has $1,000 more purchasing power thanks to China than they would without this trade. Similarly about the US Treasury bonds holding down the interest rates, but this is beginning to unravel. The fact is, we as a country continue to spend with abandon. Our government does for various reasons, whether that be guaranteed entitlement spending or military spending or other programs. We like to spend, we like the services our government provides, well, the only way to sustain that is if we can sell debt. How do you sell debt? Treasury instruments. You need foreign buyers to consume that treasury instrument. China has been a very willing buyer for a long time. Interestingly, it's not just China. Japan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, any country with a large trade surplus because of their exports tends to buy lots of US treasury instruments. We should thank them all because otherwise we would have much higher interest rates. Exports to China, even though that gray line is much lower, our net exports to China support directly and indirectly 1.8 million jobs in the United States. And then you can have the add-on effect, in addition to these exports, of all the community jobs that are serviced by them. In the Midlands, where I live, up at the University of South Carolina, we have several Chinese-owned factories which have just opened. So if you're in a small town which receives, for example, just, re just in the last two years, a new Chinese textile mill opened up state. The fact that this mill opened is wonderful. Yes, it only created directly a certain few dozen jobs, but in addition to that then, that increased buying power in the community translates into other jobs as well. Same thing with US exports. Further, as that chart suggests, Made in China goods were not really made in America anyway by the time we get to the 1980s. Remember this? Made in Hong Kong, made in Singapore, made in Malaysia. I found this one, Christmas decorations made in Japan. You might remember what this was made. Made in Thailand or the other China, made in Taiwan, Republic of China as well. 
Sustained growth of the Chinese middle class as a result of all this trade has also massively increased demand for US financial services, education, tourism, and real estate. One thing that you see a lot of now in the United States are Chinese students. Those who are coming here, especially as undergraduates, are full fee-paying students. They are paying full out-of-state tuition. So every Chinese international student that comes to the University of South Carolina, their tuition supports two or three more in-state students to be able to come at our subsidized tuition rate. So the trade balance, in many ways, is beneficial. <coughs> Nonetheless, we exist in a trade war situation now. I used to have a question mark on the title of this slide. I took it off because we are now actively in a trade dispute with China. And it's actually not just President Trump. It is not just the current administration. As the article mentions, in 2010, back under President Obama, we slapped tariffs on Chinese imports of solar panels. If you go back even further, under President George W. Bush, we slapped tariffs on Chinese-made tires. Now, it's been a long time, but do we recall what happened with the tariffs on Chinese car tires? Objectively, the reason we have these tariffs is to protect jobs in the United States, Ohio specifically, because Ohio is a swing state. We want to keep them on our, on our side in the 2004 midterm elections, right? Of course. Unfortunately, what happened with the deep so, yes, naturally, higher price, demand for Chinese tires decreased, which meant we increased purchases of tires made in Brazil. Made in Brazil. <laughs> Didn't actually affect it because once you have factories located in another place, just because it becomes more expensive doesn't mean immediately a new factory will rise out of the ground like bamboo shoots after the rain. The fact is, is that economists, we tend to ignore time in our models. It's, well, higher prices should result in a shift. Well, yes, but there is a time lag involved in that. Even if you suddenly were to slap 100% tariffs on every Chinese-made good, it would take a decade to rebuild all of that industrial infrastructure domestically to make up for it. Further, as we'll discuss, even in China, those factories are not moving to the United States as a result of the tariff war. They're just moving to Southeast Asia. We'll get to that. So let's talk about the current incarnation of the trade war. In uh, January of 2018, slapped 20 to 50% tariffs on imported washing machines, as well as 30% on solar panels again. Biggest impact, Chinese response, none. Mostly because the country that was hit the most severely by the washing machine tariffs was actually South Korea. Because one, Samsung is a major manufacturer of white box goods imported to the United States. They deeply resented this particular tariff. China decided, you know what? It's the first opening shot. Let's see what happens. Then we have the aluminum and the steel tariffs, again, designed to protect very specific industries. Your article mentions that, well, yes, we might create 10,000 plus jobs in aluminum and steel at the cost of 400,000 jobs across the broader economy. Many manufacturers, if particularly in automobiles and also in nails and other hard goods, have already noted that the rising cost of steel, thanks to these tariffs, is costing American jobs. And here's the reason. I, I actually did a little looking into that case of Mid-Continent Nail. They've been all in the news, that, that uh, factory in Missouri that said they had to lay off half their workers because of the tariffs. Here's the problem. If you put a 25% tariff, a 10% tariff on steel, which means that the price per ton goes up by, let's say, 10%, right, on the imported goods. Okay, I can't buy Canadian steel, I can't buy Chinese steel, I can't buy Russian steel, fine. I'll buy American steel. But if you're U.S. Steel in Pittsburgh, what are you going to do? Raise your price by 9.9%. You are still the cheapest option, but now you can increase your profit margins. Congratulations, your margins are padded. Maybe you fire up an old uh, mothballed factory, but you now charge all of your customers that much more, which then gets passed on through the supply chain. China's response? None. Because China doesn't sell steel to the United States. <laughs> The fact is they consume or export more locally within Asia. So China, again, is like, okay, fine, we don't care. Doesn't affect us. About per, out of the percentages of US imports of steel, China was about 3%. So 
Again, no response. Then, let's get a rise out of China. 1,300 Chinese made goods, about worth about 50 billion, were slapped with a 25% effective tariff. Okay, these were now specific tariffs against China. Now they retaliate. Directly, 106 US made goods at a 25% tariff, including, they were very surgical, items like soybeans designed to hit states like Iowa. Why do you think that China would target Iowa? <laughs> There's an election coming up next year. Iowa is a primary state with disproportionately high influence, so this is very important for them. Then, in response to September last year, we had a 10% tariff on an additional 200 billion in Chinese goods. And a threat, although currently withheld, that if they do not reach an agreement, they're meeting right now in Washington, that by April 1st they will increase that by a further 200 billion, by rising up to 25%. China's response, they directly slapped automobile tariffs against US-made cars, and they have said they still hold many options, but the main one seems to be many manufacturers in China no longer see the United States as a viable export market. If they're going to be charged tariffs in these amounts, they're simply going to have to find a new buyer for their goods. So China is going to try limited success. The US is still by far the world's largest consumer market, they're going to try to find new buyers for their goods. So, the broad economic picture of China today with this trade war. The fact is, is that China is not happy with the situation. Many of their exporters in these coastal provinces have benefited for many years thanks to the free trade regime. We in the United States as consumers have also benefited from this free trade regime. But the fact is, is that today, the political pressure in the United States is going to make these tariffs, at least for the time being, a reality. There are many people who are not huge fans of President Donald Trump, but they do actually support the tariffs on both sides of the aisle. So this is the reality that we're seeing. So what is this going to mean for China, the world's largest exporter of manufactured goods? Although, as your article notes, maybe it's the final assembler, although I think the author was being a little glib in that assessment. So where is China and where is China going? Number one, 40 years of spectacular economic growth in China has made the world's largest communist country into the world's most capitalistic and unequal country. They have a 0.49 Gini coefficient, which is a fancy economic term meaning how much of the wealth is concentrated in how many hands. In America, we say we have high degrees of economic inequality. Well, guess what? We're not number one. China is. They're far more unequal. What a 0.49 Gini coefficient means is 5% of the population controls over 30% of all wealth in the country. That's even higher disproportionate than what we have. Further, they have extremely high levels of amalgamated debt. Currently, about 250% of GDP officially and what's most terrifying about their debt level is that almost all of this has occurred since 2009. So in the space of a decade, they have increased their national debt from basically manageable very low to 250% of GDP in a decade. So in America, we talk about runaway spending. Try China. Who owns the debt? It's domestic. This is, this, is not, this is not sovereign debt. This is all debt. Bank loans, private debt, credit card debt, all debt. The United States is actually similar. We're about 270% of GDP in uh, net debt. Over capacity, as we've all heard, China has way, way, way too many factories and way too much capacity in cement, coal, and steel. This is very true. And so as a result, this does mean that China's coal and steel and cement are artificially cheap because they have so much overcapacity. Simple economics, you can produce more, Volume of the output exceeds demand, the price will fall. This is one of the reasons why the United States tried to suppress imports of all types of steel, because net globally, there is a glut of steel on the market. Now, since 2014, China's government has endeavored mightily to reduce this problem. Because even within China, this is an issue. You've probably heard the stories of the ghost cities in China where they're building these enormous new towns and suburbs, which are full of beautiful skyscrapers and apartments that are empty. This is true. 
Why do they do this? Well, if you have excess capacity in cement and steel, you gotta do something with it. We're gonna build. So this has been one of the ways that they have consumed this excess capacity, and they're trying to back off from this. At the same time, we cannot say this enough, China is not cheap anymore. Since 2004, wages in China have risen, industrial wages, have risen by 10 to 20 percent per year. So if you can imagine paying your workers minimum wage this year, and you have to guarantee them to keep them from quitting at Christmas, a 20% raise next year, and the year after that, another 20% raise, and the year after that, a 20% raise. That is what you see in China. So when people say the Chinese minimum wage is very low, that's true. No factory can pay the minimum wage, because if you paid that, no one would work for you, because the demand has far outpaced the supply. Why is that? Well, China has a declining workforce. In 2010, the working age population actually peaked and is now in terminal decline. China's population is still growing, but that's because of the, just like Japan, the aging of the population. By 2050, China's population will peak, and then will begin to actually decline, just like it does in Japan, and Sweden, and Italy, and many other countries. So if you have a declining workforce, that's only going to further aggravate the problems you have with rising industrial wages. Add to that a generational shift. Young people in China, having grown up in 40 years of continuous economic growth, they see opportunity. They are becoming educated. They're no longer leaving, leaving home at 13, 14, 15 to go get a factory job. A, there are jobs closer to home, and B, look, I've gone to school. Why would I want to go work in a factory? No one wants these jobs. And so the average age of a worker has continued to rise. It used to be that a good factory wouldn't hire anyone over the age of 25. You're 25, you're fired. You're too old, you can't work. That used to be the way of it. Now, the average age in a factory is 30 and rising. Mostly because young people will not take these jobs. They'll stay home, they'll go get a service job, they'll do anything to not work in a factory. Again, that's going to keep raising your industrial wages. <coughs> Finally, what has been the impact of all of this trade dispute and all of these rising pressures at home well, Chinese companies are moving overseas. So now you see in China, young, uh, a young person might get laid off from their factory and say, ah, Vietnam. Because where did the factory go? It went to Vietnam, it went to Cambodia, it went to Myanmar, it went to Thailand, Bangladesh. All of these countries now have cheaper wages, lower costs, lower regulations, <clears throat> lower environmental regulations. All the things we say about China, Chinese now say about Southeast Asia. So, interestingly, there was a survey done in this past year at the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, asking American companies in China, what are your plans in light of the trade dispute? They've actually, they actually responded to the survey saying, yes, the vast majority are being negatively impacted by the tariffs, hurting their business. And then they were saying, so what are you going to do? They all said, we're going to move. But everyone said they're moving to other places in Asia. They are not moving back to the United States. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The biggest one, singularly, has nothing to do with wages. Because the production chains being substantially in East Asia today mean that if you move, let's say, you probably heard about the Foxconn deal in Wisconsin, where they wanted to open a flat panel display um, factory up there. A, they massively inflated their labor. There's no way they're going to create that many because the factory simply wouldn't need them, because it's an automated factory. And moreover, where are all of the inputs for that factory going to come from? China. So that's still going to be more Chinese imports into the United States, even if you're doing final assembly here. One of the other major initiatives that you've probably heard about coming out of China is what's called the One Belt, One Road, in Chinese Yidai uh, they've actually, the original acronym, OBOR, sounds like a Bond villain's uh, plot. <laughs> so they changed the name to BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, because it sounds better in English. But in Chinese, it is. Nice and sounds. Anyway, what is it? Well, like a good Bond story, it's one to three trillion dollars in loans and guaranteed grants 
to governments and to construction companies across Asia, Europe, Central Asia, and Africa to build mostly infrastructure. You see, highways, high speed rail, freight, pipelines, ports, power plants, industrial parks, anything you need to build a massive integrated industrial chain across the Eurasian continent, China is trying to invest to build that. A couple of advantages. Number one, it requires that you can now ship goods from China to Europe without having to put it on a boat. It's actually faster. You can now ship from Yiwu, China, which is, if you've ever bought, uh, in the last 20 years, bought a Christmas item. I had the one from Japan. But if you bought anything Christmassy, you bought it made in Yiwu, China. It's Christmas town. It's where all the Christmas decorations are made. Yiwu now has direct train service to Europe. So they no longer need to ship it three months by boat. Now it can be there in two weeks by train. This is what the One Belt Run Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, is enabling. At the same time, however, they also have the new Maritime Silk Road, which is trying to link China with South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa in order to provide new sources of demand for Chinese manufactured goods. This is no shorter than an attempt to wean China off of its reliance on the U.S. market. Now, can the entirety of the rest of the world make up for U.S. consumer demand? Maybe. But at least it is an attempt to diversify. Not unlike any company today that says, I want a factory in the U.S., one in China, and one in Germany, you want to diversify because that's how you compete. And China is now, as a mature economy, doing the same thing. Now I get to talk about, now I get to geek out a little bit. And unfortunately, as a captive audience, you are now going to indulge me as I talk about things that are much more close to my heart, specifically little factories in a town called Dongguan. Dongguan, you may or may not have ever heard of, but I guarantee you, if you bought a pair of shoes in the last 20 years, especially if it was a pair of athletic shoes, it was made in Dongguan. You bought, how many of you wear glasses? Glasses. All right. What brands do you wear? Doesn't matter. They're Luxottica. They're made by the Italian conglomerate named Luxottica. Their factory is in Dongguan. If you have bought a uh, unit of clothing, good chance at some point it went through Dongguan. If you have an electronic, I guarantee you parts of it were made in Dongguan. It's the most important city that you've never heard of. <laughs> Where is it? If you think about the map of China, down on the deep southern coast, you know Hong Kong, the green spot here. The area around it in orange, this area is called the Pearl River Delta, which is China's industrial heartland, and historically, for the last 40 years, has been the base of their export economy. Most of their electronics, garments, shoes, toys, all the made in China stuff that we talk about, this is where it came from for the last 40 years. Dongguan, is just upriver from Shenzhen. It's this crescent roll shaped city right here named Dongguan. Dongguan is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, Dr. Jekyll, this picture I snapped myself two years ago walking through the central square. It's a pretty day, the sky is blue, I have a lousy camera, that's why it looks white. In the fountains, you have a, this is of course their government building which is a lovely concrete edifice full of bureaucrats. Every major Chinese city and minor Chinese city has these lovely facilities today, which is why four years ago, the new president, Xi Jinping, said no more building government buildings because they figured this was not an efficient use of capital. Dongguan looks like China writ even larger. Going back to the mid-1990s, Dongguan went into a spectacular economic boom. You might remember the violent seesawing of growth rates in China. Here's Dongguan's growth rate through the financial crisis. Nearly 20% per year, every year, year upon year. Depending on who you asked during that time, their exports were growing at well more than 30% per year, each year. The population of the city grew by perhaps as much as a million per year. That's an exaggeration, but this is what was being said on the streets in Dongguan. Then you had the financial crisis. Their growth rate collapsed, but has since recovered and again stabilized. The economy has done spectacularly well. But we'll get to this in a moment. Exports, 
Again, starting more recently, this collapse, that's the financial crisis, there's 20% loss in one year. That was a big ding to their economy. But exports have continued to grow. Traditionally, as I mentioned, this Dongguan, I'm not sure if you can read Chinese, but each of the words on here, those just represent the names of the different townships that make up the city of Dongguan. It's kind of a weird thing to call it a city, because the city is here in red, Guangzhou. That's actually the urban center where that government building is located. The rest of it used to be communes back in the day. But in 1988, they reorganized the city and said, you know what? We're no longer going to be a rural county. We're going to be a city. OK, what does that mean? It meant that instead of having rural towns, you then made them urban townships. So basically, what you have is a network of closely linked cities, each of which has a population north of 100,000, 500,000, a million, being the average size of most of these towns. And by Chinese standards, a city of 500,000 is a small city. <laughs> Just so y'all know. What do they make? Well, electronic components in Zhijie, Chang'an, Qingxi, Kangxiao. All of these places make lots of electronics. And specifically, who is making them? Companies from Taiwan. So back in the 1980s, you might remember a company called Acer, which was the maker of computers for IBM, other uh, general PC brands. Well, all of their suppliers in 1994 through 1998 moved to Dongguan. If any of you have ever owned a Apple product, you have owned some a battery pack from the company called Delta. Delta Power Supplies employs thousands of people in Shijie. When Delta moved to Dongguan, they told all of their Taiwanese suppliers, move. You will come and co-locate with us in Dongguan, or we will no longer do business together. 300 companies moved immediately. This is how they developed overnight into a manufacturing powerhouse. Similarly, plastic stuff made in Changping, knitwear made in Dalang, if you own a sweater, there's a good chance it came from Dalai. Everything, yes, Chang'an is the first city in Dongguan that was open to foreign trade and foreign investment, and it, and it is, to this day, a giant sea of factories. From one end of the township to the other, there's not an inch of unoccupied ground. It is all factories, everybody. Furniture and garments in this town called El Aqiman, and footwear in Hojie. Hojie, again, as I said, if you own a pair of shoes, there's a good chance, even if today the shoe was assembled in Vietnam, the laces might still have been made in Hojie, or the glue that binds it together is made in Hojie. And then there's Mr. Hot. This picture, not nearly as pretty as the government building with the fountains and the blue sky, these are abandoned factories in Qingxi. Despite the claims from the local government that there is no industrial real estate for rent, there is lots of vacant space there today. Again, it's all in Chinese, but what is very interesting about Dongwa is they still report in their annual economic development report, they still report output, meaning pieces manufactured of different industrial goods. Like back in the old planned economy, how many, not how much value did you make, how many cars did you make? So here, for instance, we have the output of uh, digital speakers, okay? And it literally is in 10,000 pieces. How many speakers were made in Dongwa? So even in their official reports, these red marks show the annual declines in output of these goods year on year. And some of them are spectacular. Furniture, 30% decline in one year. Uh, here we have uh, metal cases, i.e. like the boxes that go on computers, 50% decline in one year. This is the annual changes that they're experiencing. So they are definitely in an economic readjustment period. So what is occurring? Well, we have widespread factory closures. The urban population has fallen between 3 and 6 million, depending on who's counting, over the last decade. This is an enormous change in the city. So the images that we have of China as being the factories full of people with their heads bowed working at stations, that was true until 2008. <clears throat> Today, when you see a city that's declined in population by 6 million in the space of a decade, that's the change going on now. 
and you have the collapse already ongoing in these traditional industries. These statistics are from 2015. These predate the trade war. So this was already going on even before we tried to impact Chinese manufactured goods. And yet, at the same time in Dongguan, we see there is a rise in value added in electronics. We have a rise in different new brands making things in the country. What does it look like? The blue. 58% year-on-year increase in output of <coughs> cell phones. Dongguan is now the world's leading manufacturing center for smartphones. Where are they made? They're made in Dongguan. And if not finally, at least parts of them are. Similarly, you have 53% increase in integrated circuit production. Here we have 70% increase in production of digital cameras. And it's not the old you know, digital cameras I used to keep in my pocket. These are the cameras that go into the smartphones. They're made in Dongguan. Similarly, we now have the rise no longer of anonymous export factories, but of strong brands in their own right. Shufuji, this is a Taiwanese company. We're coming up to Chinese New Year. If you're going to celebrate Chinese New Year, you need Shufuji cookies. You need Shufuji candied fruits. Where are they made? They're made in Dongguan. Luxottica, their factory is still there. Marco Polo, this is a fascinating company. They make floor tiles. And interestingly, guess where their first foreign investment was? U.S. of A. They have a factory in Lebanon, Tennessee, where they're making floor tiles for the U.S. market. Why are they doing it? Because amazingly, electricity is cheaper in America than it is in China. <clears throat> and to make floor tiles, those kilns need a lot of electricity. Where do you get it? We get it in America. <clears throat> Yishun, it's a huge uh, uh, clothing manufacturer very popular brand in China. Uh, Cosmo Lady is the number one internet's brand in China, even larger than the famous Triumph, which is a Taiwanese brand, and similarly larger than Victoria's Secret. Sinomax, their, uh, their US headquarters is in Houston, Texas. They are a manufacturer of pillows and mattresses, bedding, Chinese brand. And then of course the Vivo and Oppo, Oppo and Vivo vie for positions three, four, and five, depending on the year, as the largest cell phone brands in the world. And of course, we all know about Huawei. Huawei's corporate headquarters are in Shenzhen downriver, but in this area called Songshan Lake in central Dongguan, they have built their own massive engineering campus, and their manufacturing is all done right here in Dongguan. So what are all these companies doing? We have this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde effect. So what is actually going on in China? Specifically, what are Chinese firms doing to maintain their competitiveness going forward? I call it Go China. Not woo woo, but go as in the operative verb. How do you go in order to strategically compete if you're a manufacturer? What are firms there doing? Number one, go big. Many firms are seeking to use economies of scale in order to still achieve profit at extremely thin margins. Companies like Foxconn, which may be Taiwanese, but all of their operations are in China, they compete on an extremely thin margin, about 2% of their operating revenue. So their revenues, hundreds of billions, their profits, maybe 2% of that, very low. How do you do it? Well, you automate. Those workers, 10 to 20% per year, forget it, give me a robot. But the thing is, I don't want to move to Vietnam or to Cambodia where workers are cheap. I want to stay here where my components are available. The only way to do that is to automate. So massive scale, massive automation. So what we're <coughs> seeing in China is a move away from this high degree of fragmentation, especially in electronics and these other capital intensive industries, moving more into massive conglomerates. And an example of that, you might have heard occasionally about there's a factory in China called the Workerless Factory. It used to employ several hundred, now it employs 30. But its output has increased and its quality has gone up. How did they do it? Well, they completely automated their production lines. Janus, uh, by the way, they make, uh, anybody own a Samsung cell phone by any chance? Yeah. Janus. Those guts were made by Janus. Uh, Alco Electronics, uh, how many of you own an off-brand tablet? Alco, they made Toshiba, uh, specifically made 
they make them on uh, contract for Toshiba. They make the tablets for them. Their factory used to employ 15,000, now it employs 1,500. How do they do it? They automate. I was touring their factory floor, it was quite amusing, except it's a little creepy when the little robots come and then stop and ask you to move. <laughs> and, then, and then they scoot on by to deliver the parts to the different parts of the box. Alternately, go small. <clears throat> Going big works if you have the ability to use high amounts of automation. Alternately, you can try to shed every bit of unnecessary business function or overhead. So this factory is a factory that does nothing but paint. All they do is spray paint onto plastic items. Use of small and medium-sized enterprises as subcontractors is very widespread in China. It was described in your article as a problem. In China, it is considered a source of competitive advantage. Having a single company do it might work, but you also could have 15 hyper-specialized providers of each service within the manufacturing chain. Each of these small independent businesses gives a business person the opportunity to create their own enterprise, and it creates jobs, although not very many, for the workers involved. I'm currently working on a paper in which I discuss this idea of on-demand production capacity. If you're a very large factory, you're a Foxconn, you need enormous orders all the time in order to sustain your business. But what if demand fluctuates? Well, if you build out the capacity to serve a large order, when you have less demand, you now have overhead, workers that you have to pay, machines that you have to idle, rent that you have to continue shelling out. These small firms compete by avoiding that entirely. Their idea essentially is, if I get a big order, I can't fill all of it, I will contact my network of friends who provide the exact same service in their small factories, and we can collectively scale up or down on demand. So this has revitalized small and medium-sized enterprises in China. Interestingly, you might remember I mentioned earlier about all of those diligent workers with their heads bent 10 years ago. These factories are owned by those former workers. What it was is you spend a few years working at a press. You know what? I can do that. Scrape together enough money, buy a press, start a business. And that's how these advantages work. Go up. Go high end. Massive increases in investment in R&D is the wave of many large Chinese enterprises. They are actually trying to expand out of production and into the R&D and the core components of many of these products, as well as then increased efforts at branding. So what do you see? Companies like Oppo Electronics. Oppo, you may have never heard of them, but they're very big in Asia, huge in China, and they have the best cell phone cameras ever. They can make me look attractive in front of <coughs> That's good software, that's Oppo. Emma, CNC technology. I guarantee you've never heard of them. But if you think about it, if your image of making a shoe is of a, co of, is of a cobbler doing their work by hand, or alternately the uh, women with their headscarves on, you know, pulling together sneakers, Emma is trying to change that. Emma CNC, Computer Numeric Control, used to be a shoe manufacturer in Dongguan. They, they made shoes on contract. One day their boss had an epiphany. There's no money. I'm a contract manufacturer stitching together shoes for Nike. I'm never going to get ahead in life. But here's an idea. I know how to make shoes. Why don't I make robots to make shoes for us? Emma is now exporting to Italy their leather cutting and design and automation technologies for shoe production. This is the trend that many Chinese firms are trying to move into. No longer just making the goods, but making the machines that make those goods and doing so at a high degree of automation. With those rising labor costs, they have a very high incentive to do this quicker. Go down. Many Chinese brands have decided that, you know what, the US market, the European market, forget it. Apple and Samsung already have those markets quartered. I don't need to fight for them. But you know where, where the money is? The money's in Africa. The money is in India. These are emerging markets where people want cell phones. They want smartphones, they want laptops, they want all of these advanced products. But they want all of that for 100 bucks or less. So how do you do that? Well, you move into these price-sensitive markets. You explore cost down or niche innovations specific to the needs of these markets. 
So Coolpad, again, a company you've never heard of, is a cell phone brand that is extremely popular in India. It's a Chinese company. They don't sell very much in China, but they've decided that the Indian market is where they can pursue competitive advantage with low-end smartphones, and they've been very successful by moving down. Garment manufacturers. Very interesting is a lot of those companies in China that used to make my coat on contract have decided, you know what, I've got 10 workers, I've got the internet. I can create a micro-targeted brand that uses internet marketing to sell domestically or internationally as, as needed. And by only having a handful of workers, my brand can also reduce its overhead. So this has become a new trend within China is micro -brand. Go out. Chinese firms are aggressively expanding overseas, trying to manufacture in other parts of Asia, other parts of the world, or like Marco Polo, in the United States. They're relocating entirely. Many factories have just given up and said, I'm not going to do any work in China except for my R&D and branding. We'll get to that in a second. Or they've opened supplemental facilities in lower cost locations. <clears throat> they've had to learn New human resource management. One of the things in speaking with a company called Longchang Technology, they are a, originally were a Hong Kong invested toy manufacturer. They now own a factory, their larger factory is now no longer in China, but rather is in Indonesia. If you're operating in a majority Muslim country, what is one of the things you have to build into the workday? Prayer time. Prayer time. You have to stop the lines several times during the workday to allow workers to pray. In China, you don't have to do this. Once the workers come, they work until quitting time, and if you have a, a rush order, they don't quit. They keep working until midnight or later until the order is done. You can't do that in Southeast Asia. And so these companies have had to learn an entirely new set of human resource <laughs> tactics that do not involve, well, work more. Because that used to be their main approach in China. <coughs> Transition, Holdings is a company you, have any of you heard of Transion? Probably not. Mostly because they're not even big in China. They are a Chinese owned company that does all of their manufacturing in Africa. They make cell phones specifically for the African and Indian market. Their owner's vision very early on was where is the demand in the future? It is in Africa and India. So how do I reduce my cost and make it specialized? Well, I'm going to make my phones in Ethiopia. That's exactly what they've done. And their innovations are fascinating. So here's an interesting trend. In India, traditionally, people eat with their hands. Right? That's how you do it. Fun, good, sufficient, works, right? Here's the problem. Your hands get greasy. How do you check your messages on your phone when you have greasy fingers? Transit has developed a technology that makes the screen both sensitive to greasy fingers, but also not easily stained. It sounds insignificant, but that is a high-value added thing for a specific niche market. Apple would never do that, because they wouldn't think about a niche market. This is opportunities that, in China, they are trying to capitalize on. Or go home. Go big, go small, go up, go down, go out, or go out of business. In China, as mentioned, thousands upon thousands of companies are going bankrupt. There are many manufacturers who are not following one of these approaches, who are trying to remain dedicated contract manufacturers as their products fall into lesser demand, as the trade war takes effect, and as labor costs rise, they are going bankrupt. This is a factory being torn down to make room for an apartment building. Firms are unable to shift, they are failing. This is particularly true of the once vaunted Hong Kong and Taiwanese firms. So in Dongguan, where Hong Kong and Taiwanese companies once dominated the industry, they are failing by the dozens. And it's very common. You're, if you read about Dongguan in the paper, there's a good chance they're talking about the economy doing badly, and they'll cite the reference of a Taiwanese firm with 10,000 employees that failed. Well, they didn't follow one of these strategies, and as a result, of course they're going to go home. Interestingly, what you are seeing as a result is a hollowing out of the middle of the Chinese manufacturing chain. Used to, you had small, medium, and very large enterprises, but it seems, according to my research, very small enterprises, whether they're going for the niche markets or going for that scalable production, 
They are competitive. Extremely large firms, R&D intensive or economies of scale, they do very well. In the middle, they're, they're really struggling. And a lot of these manufacturers that are going bankrupt were these medium-sized companies. And that's where you're starting to see a hollow. The other example, of course, is Yue Yuan. They were actually a very large firm. They were the company I was mentioning. If you have a pair of sneakers bought in the last 10 years, odds are they're a Yue Yuan manufacturer. It's a Taiwanese company that makes shoes, branded, what they call branded athletic footwear, as a the industry term. So what did they do? Well, they hired 40,000 workers. Actually, at, at peak, they had 70,000 at their factory in Dongguan. This is Albuquerque, New Mexico, making shoes. <laughs> They're no longer in China because they could not afford the labor. And they couldn't, even more worse than that, you couldn't find the workers that you would need. Many factories of this medium size are chronically understaffed. So you have to automate. Yue Yuan said, you know what? I don't want to buy Emma's automation technology. I want to continue using women making shoes. So I have to go to Southeast Asia. And so they have. So what does this mean? Well, China's a mixed bag. The economy is still growing. Contrary to what you may read, there is real economic vitality underneath the frothy bubbles of their real estate and their cement and steel sectors. They are continuing to export. They're finding new sources of demand for their products. They are finding new competitive strategies that enable them to succeed. But there are real headwinds being faced. So at the same time, China is not the unstoppable locomotive, but nor is it one day away from economic collapse. So, to wrap it up, this was me in 2004 when I first moved to China. This is in my office. You would never see this in China today. Even then, they thought my students thought my output was, helpless, was hopelessly old-fashioned even in 2004. But moreover, central heating, automobiles, high technology, everything, cashless society, in many ways, China has leapfrogged past the developed West. Indeed, if any of you want to go on vacation in China, it will be very hard to buy things. Many companies, or even kiosks on the street, no longer accept cash. Everything is paid with your phone. China has made enormous strides, so to understand the competition, we need to appreciate China for what it is. So, thank you very much, and I look forward to the Q&A. Okay, before we go on break, I do have an apology. I forgot to ask Sammy to come up and talk about Ollie. Uh, Ollie is a sponsor with all the others that I mentioned, and uh, I'm sorry, Sammy, I forgot it. Would you like to come up and say a few words about Ollie? Because I know some folks aren't familiar with Ollie here, so please do. Thank you. Um, all I wanted to do is, uh, for those who are not familiar with what we do in Ollie, which is the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, we have a desk out there, and please stop by and pick up a catalog or talk to somebody who is holding a catalog, uh, basically to tell you a bit about some of the programs. Uh, one of the things that you may want to know, this, is a, a, this series, The uh, Great Decisions, is a four-week, um, and right after that, beginning March, we also have at Ollie, right across the 501 uh, highway from campus, uh, we have a center in the uh, Burroughs and Chapin building, and uh, every Saturday in, in, uh, in March, we have a religion series. We have, we're really fortunate to have four CCU professors who will be talking about Buddhism, Islam, uh, Christianity, and uh, Judaism. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, talk to one of our representatives out there, and you will find out that we actually, it's not strictly February, but we also have a program in March. And th thank you for the opportunity, and see you out there. Okay, just a reminder, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a break now, about 15 minutes or so. During the break, if you have questions that you'd ask, like to ask uh, Professor Murphy, there's cards in the back table. Just write them out on the card, leave them in the basket. I'll consolidate those, and then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and ask those questions, because some may be very similar, and that way I can co combine them and we get more questions asked that way. The other thing I wanted to remind you about is um, there's the uh, Great Decisions Opinion Ballot. 
I, I printed out hard copies of these. Uh, they're in the book, but they're also online. You can go online and fill them out. But for those who prefer to do a paper copy, pick one of these up. Just hold on to it for the entire four weeks. Uh, it includes all eight programs, so you just fill out the ones that you attended, even if you only come for one week. Uh, and then just turn these in at the end of the four weeks. I send those to the great to the Foreign Policy Association. They consolidate them of all the programs all over the country, and then they publish them in a, in a, in a, in a report. This is the report from last year. So all of you who contributed to that, that actually filled out those ballots, turned them in, either did them online or gave them to me, your results are part of this tabulation. So I've got one copy of these. I'll leave it on the back table if you'd like to take a look at it or you're just kind of curious to see what the, the response was. And it's also available online if you go to the Foreign Policy Association. So I do want to mention that. Lastly, any students who came in who did not sign in, please sign in on the table back here. You know, put your, your section number, your professor. And if there's anybody from the Wall Business School who's uh, here for PDA credit, that's a separate sign-in sheet, so just make sure you sign in on the wall sheet for me. Okay, so let's take a break and we'll convene in about 15 minutes. Very similar to be able to do that. I've tried to break them down into different categories, one that relates to the U.S.-China trade, other with domestic issues, things like that. So I want to try to get a smattering of the different types of questions that are being asked. So first one, we combine these two. It says, uh, what has the U.S. gained with all the tariffs? And instead of tariffs, what, in your opinion, is the best way to foster better training practices between the U.S. and China? Okay. Very good. That's an excellent question, and it's a very difficult one to answer in five minutes, but I'll try to do it in three. So, <laughs> in short, what has the U.S. gained by it? We feel good. We feel good that we have uh, taken a very concrete and measurable step to express displeasure with Chinese trading practices. And of course, if you are a, steel, uh, a, a formerly laid off steel worker in Pittsburgh who now has their job back, of course you're highly, you believe that these have been very useful. But what has been the actual impact on the US economy? Positively, an economist would say zero. It, all it has done is raise consumer prices on the goods that were formerly, that were imported from China. And in terms of reshoring of manufacturing, as I mentioned, it has not accomplished that. It just makes companies consider moving their factories to another country as opposed to doing no work within China. What should be done in lieu of that is exactly what we're trying to do now, although under with the current pause in further raising the tariffs, is negotiating what are the specific Chinese trade practices that the United States finds objectionable or that are not permitted but have been <clears throat> wink wink tolerated under WTO rules. These are things that can be highlighted in negotiations and both sides can express their displeasure in various ways. For instance, China has uh, for years chafed against certain export restrictions of US technologies and the restrictions on Chinese firms investing in the United States. The Amer American companies say, well, we can't invest in China. Chinese firms say, well, we can't invest in the United States. So mutually, there are areas that could be dealt with. But unfortunately, from the political perspective, neither side would find that to be very pleasing because negotiations are messy, they're slow, and they result in compromises, which, as we remember our Calvin and Hobbes, a good compromise makes everybody mad. So unfortunately, there's no easy solution. Okay. On, on the domestic side, uh, can you please comment on the movement of rural populations in China to Dongguan? or wherever the jobs are, and, and what, type, what is that having in terms of impacts on families, birth control, population planning, and also how are workers in China protected by the state regarding health care, retirement, unemployment? Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. All right. Number one, um, what happens with the young people? So in the rural countryside today, the countryside is depopulated of young people. If you go, especially to the more marginal agricultural <coughs> villages in areas that are highly mountainous or facing desertification, you have old people and you have very young people, children, and no one else. Because everyone of working age has long since migrated either to the nearest town to take a job as a hairdresser or working as a cook in a restaurant, or has migrated to the coast to find work on construction sites or in factories. This, of course, is across the entire, entirety of China's rural area. So which, the impact, of course, of this on families is you have left behind children. You have these young, young people being raised by grandparents who love them and care for them, but 
As we know, this is a suboptimal social outcome compared to being raised by your birth parents. And so there have been issues with students who struggle in school. They can't concentrate. They tend to, some run wild. It just depends. Some, of course, do perfectly fine in this environment, but it has been a very severe problem because they only see mom and dad once a year. Invariably in China, at Chinese New Year, there'll be a human interest story in the media of a dad who comes home for Chinese New Year whose child doesn't recognize him. These, these things happen. And it's unfortunate, but it has been the nature of migration to force this. Then the next question is, where, how is this changing? One, as the economy has grown, you no longer have the strong incentive to move 3,000 miles away in search of work. There are construction jobs in the next town over. You no longer need to be gone for months and months at a time. So this trend of complete migration has shifted. Further, it's become more common as people have moved to the cities to eventually bring their families as well. And China has new laws which are trying to encourage family reunification to allow the parents to live together and have their children educated in the cities in which they reside. This is still a work in progress, but they're trying to make it so that it's possible to live together even if you don't work in your home area. <coughs> Further, in China they have a system called the hukou, which is a household residential system that historically has tied your social benefits, that is your health care, your retirement, etc., to the city in which you were born or the province, or specifically to the village, if you're rural, in which you were born. This system is currently being reformed to make it somewhat easier to transfer your rural go to the city in which you live, if you so desire, or to still receive social benefits in the city in which you reside, even if you do not have a local residency permit. They are beginning to reform the system. And finally, for, in terms of the protections for workers, in 2008, China enacted the, what is always called the new labor laws. Everyone, the labor laws, you know, all of yours, the labor law. This now requires the payment of social insurance by every employer for every worker on the line. It, it creates a form of tenure for employees, such that after they've worked a certain amount of time, it becomes somewhat more difficult to fire that employee which also necessitates if you want to fire an employee that you must provide them with back or severance pay. There's a whole variety of these types of programs designed to inc improve workers' rights in these rural fact in these uh, manufacturing facilities. Is it a perfect system? No, of course not. But like everything in China, it is a work in progress. Does China still have the one-child policy? No, they do not. The one-child policy was always a bit more fragmented than the monolithic name one-child policy sounds like. One, the ethnic minorities in China, so you've heard about the Tibetans or the Uyghurs or the Zhuangzu or the Miaozu and all of these different ethnic groups, they were always allowed to have more than one child. Rural people were also allowed to have two under certain circumstances. It was only urban residents that were restricted to one. And today, seeing what we talked about with the decline in population, Every family, no matter what your situation, is allowed to have two children now. But they're now facing the same problem that you see in many developed and wealthy countries. Well, mom and dad both work. It's really expensive to raise a child. I only really want to have one. And so there was this expectation of a massive surge in births after they rescinded the one-child policy. It has not yet materialized. There has been some uptick, but there's still a very low birth rate. Can you comment on the role of state-owned industries and their effect on the economy? And are the public enterprises growing, or is it just only in the private sector? This is a very difficult question. The role of state-owned enterprise in China naturally has decreased massively over the last 40 years, from 1978, when the economy was entirely state-controlled and planned, to today, in which the plan, as such, exists on paper, but it's mostly targets of these are industries that we are interested in supporting and want to see a high degree of growth and investment. But the government does not mandate as it used to, this many million tons of steel must be produced or you rubber factory will produce this much rubber to send to this tire factory. That type of planning has long since expired. The role of state owned enterprises today is basically they are under the charge to be commercially competitive. They are supposed to make a profit. And the government as shareholder would like to see these companies be profitable. 
They also exist to accomplish some of these strategic objectives, so they do have access to capital. But they are still, most of them, are now also publicly traded in Hong Kong, <coughs> some even in New York. And so as publicly traded enterprises, their books are public, they have to actually operate competitively. Unfortunately, being state-owned enterprises, they also sometimes have social responsibilities, like pensions, that can be very expensive liabilities for the firm, which sometimes makes it difficult for them to be profitable. On the whole, in China's economy, the vitality is in the private sector. If you want to see, like these firms that I'm talking about, these are not state-owned companies. These are companies, some of them have grown to be massive publicly traded firms, but they are not owned by the government. And indeed, sometimes they complain that they face the same restrictions in access to capital or access to markets that even foreign enterprises face. But the vitality and the innovation you see in China is coming from that entrepreneurial private sector. I think the question was, how much of the U.S. debt does China own? And then what other tactics or actions can the U.S. take to level out the trade deficit? Okay. Uh, short answer is not much. A trillion, more than a trillion dollars sounds like a very large number, but in terms of the amount of outstanding treasury sec securities that are owned both domestically and internationally, it's a very small percentage. And further, of course, you'll some of your talking heads in the media saying, well, one day if China gets mad, they'll just dump their treasury sec securities and crash the US economy. Why would they do that? Because to do so would be to remove their entire holdings of foreign exchange and make them worthless. That would be economic suicide, they would not do that. And furthermore, they couldn't because let's just say they wanted to unload a trillion dollars in securities, they'd have to find somebody who wants to today buy a trillion dollars in securities. There, is not, there isn't that much demand, so it's, just, it, it's not actually economically feasible. So what can be done about the trade deficit? Well, the main problem is one, don't focus too much on the, tr the trade in goods, which is where so much of this emphasis is. Consider the trade in, in services, where the US has a, a trade surplus with China and an advantage. Focus more on developing our capabilities to move those products, the services, into the Chinese market. So in these negotiations, increasing the access of US financial firms to the Chinese market would be a much better strategy than trying to hit China with tariffs. Because that would actually augment our advantages rather than trying to penalize China for something that the US no longer has this competitive advantage in, i.e. basic manufacturing. The other thing to remember is, as economists will tell you, in the aggregate, trade deficits don't actually matter. Now obviously at the very local level, if your textile mill closes, then they do matter enormously. But in the aggregate, the fact that we export less goods to China than we import is a sign more of the fact that the United States is an advanced consuming, consuming society, whereas China as a developing country is still in the production stage. So while there could be reduction, reduction of that would be more on the side of advancing our capabilities in selling services to China, and less in terms of trying to undo China's manufacturing advantage. Um, it says, considering the increased robotics in factories, why is there not a surplus of labor? And also, do you believe that the increased automation shifting consumer markets will allow China to lever, levy greater influence over contested territories such as Taiwan or Hong Kong? Okay, two kind of separate issues. Number one is, as economists have tried to know when people freak out about the automation revolution, saying, the robots are coming for your jobs. Half of you've seen statistics where they say by 2050 there will be no more truck drivers in the in the world. By uh, 2020 there will be no more technologists because it could be all automated, etc. One, calm down. Every new technology that gets introduced creates new jobs that we don't know what they are. When we kicked everybody off the farms, they found jobs in factories. When we kicked them out of the factories, they're finding service jobs. Now, are they as stable and secure and as well paid? Oftentimes, no. But the, the economy continues to generate new forms of employment. On average, this seems to be the way it is. Now, as for the other, China's influence over Hong Kong and Taiwan, I'm not a political scientist. I don't really touch the political side. But the main approach in China has been and will remain through economic leverage. The attempt to try to economically bind these territories of greater China into a political hole at some undefined point in the future. 
but it's mostly through economic influence. So for example, the, uh, recently in China, they now offer very strong incentives for Taiwanese entrepreneurs to come to China and set up businesses. Young people who are starting service companies, not manufacturing. For the Taiwanese, this is an excellent opportunity. China is a much larger market. And so that does work in terms of this economic incentive. How does that affect politically? Um, that's a very open question. We have a number of intelligence and national security studies students here, so I'll appreciate this question. Huawei, 5G networks. Does the government of China coerce companies to spy for them? Number one, um, I actually just got interviewed by Bloomberg. It was published yesterday talking about Huawei, so it's an interesting question. Huawei has been in the news because it is the dominant Chinese telecommunications equipment provider. They are also now number two in the world behind Ericsson in terms of their global market share. Why are they number two in the world? Because they make well-priced, highly sophisticated products that work and provide excellent after-sales service. They've been, they are an extremely competitive, highly innovative firm. Now, the security aspect of Huawei is a bit confusing. One, they're a highly opaque company by their company culture. Apple, you have Steve Jobs, he's very gregarious, he gives lots of talks, that affects the company culture. Ren Zhengfei, the founder of Huawei, is a deeply private individual. He does not get interviews, he does not like to get interviews. That secrecy becomes part of the company DNA, and of course if you don't know much about a company, it makes it easy to project whatever feelings you have onto that firm. Now as for 5G, Huawei, by some numbers that I've seen, again it depends how you're counting, controls less than 10% of the standards essential patents for that standard. Qualcomm, the American firm, alone controls 15% of the standards essential patents. So even though Huawei is very influential in the standard, they do not control it in any meaningful sense. They are a participant along with many others in developing this standard, which is negotiated and voted upon by engineers from all over the world. Huawei doesn't control it in any as for the, does Huawei spy for the Chinese government? Short answer is, there's no evidence one way or the other, but the perception is because they are a deeply private firm and they're from China, that maybe they will. Of course, for as a company, I look at it from a business perspective, that would be business suicide, because the moment that, they, that this would be uncovered, and as we know, everything leaks eventually, if they were to be uncovered, they would no longer be number two in the world, they would be destroyed. They would lose any orders anywhere in the world. That would be the end of the company. So there's been no evidence one way or the other, but being an opaque firm, unfortunately, makes it very easy for people to assume, well, if we don't know they're not spying, then maybe they are, but that's an assumption. Okay. Also in the news, the, the recent discussions about soybeans, um, U.S. farmers, can you address the current negotiated uh, trend or beneficial, how does it benefit the United States, the current uh, discussion going on? Particularly in the I'm not privy and I've not been following closely with the most recent round of negotiations, but ideally the argument would be that China would reduce the tariffs that it's currently assessing on U.S. soybeans, which would then make them more competitive with Brazilian soybeans and then increase Chinese imports of this U.S. product. Obviously, the current negotiation round is very fraught with a lot of substantial differences of opinion. Soybeans is one area where presumably China's consumers would welcome less expensive soybeans. So similarly, this is an area where China has an incentive to reach an agreement, but that would be contingent on reaching a broader set of agreements that are much more contentious. Okay. Um, it says, I understand that financial transactions are done by phone. I also understand that to obtain a phone <coughs> has this app capability, you must have a Chinese phone number and local address and basic account. Uh, this allows a lot of control by the government. You want to comment about that? Indeed. Um, China has now instituted a version of a real ID system. It used to be every time I went to China, I would walk to a kiosk and I would get a new phone number. No questions asked, pay the money, get a phone. It was easy. Get a phone chip or a SIM card, put it in your phone. Now you actually have to show a real ID. They want to link your phone to an actual identity. Nothing particularly unusual about that. Similarly with having an address. Similarly, if you're going to do everything in a cashless society, you're going to want to have traceability. Otherwise, a cashless society can be lend itself to potential um, playing around in ways that you might not want to do with money, let's just say. 
uh, financial chicanery, as it were. But is this really any different substantively from the way that any company today is trying to monitor what users have? In the United States, under the Old Patriot Act, companies were recording this information about who was calling whom in the metadata and passing it on to the government. In China, the same thing. So the fact is, everything we are doing financially in any country now, if it's done electronically, it is being monitored and it's leaving a record. The question is, who has access to that data and what are they doing with it? That just depends on your government. That every, everything we do, if you want to be untraceable, use cash. Otherwise, everything we do is being monitored. Can you compare uh, Chinese with US problem solving, creativity, and innovation in light of manufacturing? So what I would say is that in China, this is a great question. The fact is, is that their education system has expanded enormously at the university level in the last 20 years, producing hundreds of thousands of graduates per year many of whom have engineering and science training. This produces an enormous surface of would-be researchers who can then be put to task on developing AI, developing better robots, developing better production technologies. And the demand from the factories is there. So what this means, of course, is that they're going to have a human resource advantage in this. In the same way, why is the United States better at financial services than any other country? because we produce the finest finance majors in the world, as well as geologists and other quantitative modelers who can do these jobs. So each country is developing unique capabilities that will give it advantages. One area where China is potentially going to have a greater advantage is in AI, but I would argue this is not because of their engineers so much as it is the raw material, i.e. data. Because of it moving so rapidly to a cashless society with a high degree of linked sensors and monitors, you have lots of data to feed into AI systems. And that's what they need in order to learn and develop and become more useful. That volume of data in China, I would argue, just floating on opinion, but my opinion is, is that it will give them a competitive advantage. I try to buy made in the USA, but find it very difficult. If I'm successful, how can I be assured that it is 100% USA produced? <laughs> Short answer? Cut the tree down and make it yourself. <laughs> in fact, any, I tell my students I have a, a sign in one of my lectures which says, it's not really made in America. The fact is, it's also not really made in China. Global value chains mean that virtually every complex manufactured good that we consume is made up of integrated parts that are made in different parts of the world and then put together. So even if, let's say, that you do pay the extra premium to get an American-made jacket, they are available, you can do this. There's no guarantee that the buttons on that jacket didn't come from a uh, place called Chaoho in China, which makes most of the world buttons. <laughs> so the fact is maybe the coat is made in America, it might even be US wool, but the fact is, is that some parts of it might be imported, and there's no way to know that unless you know the manufacturer and you talk to them and say, can I talk to your sourcing guys who actually got the product to make sure they came from another US firm? Then you go talk to them and say, where did you really get that? And even if they were US made buttons, was the plastic for those buttons US made? Or was that made in Germany? It's very difficult to unpack these. Um, China is a communist country with a capitalist economy. Can you explain how the Dow Jones versus their financial markets work in terms of their effects they have on the economies. Again, this is way outside of my area of research and way outside my area of expertise, so take this with a very large grain of salt. Generally speaking, all that, that means is that China has a much more tightly regulated financial market than the United States does, which has advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, it is much more insulated from global financial swings Disadvantages, um, the domestic market also tends to be subject to very violent swings. So within China, um, the, the markets go up and they go down very rapidly. And so in many ways it is very much, you know, people stereotype the stock market as a casino. In China, in many ways it's treated as such. But the government does try to regulate and insulate it from at least global competitive pressures and global risks as much as possible. In the United States, with our competitive advantage in finance, we want to have as open a market as possible. 
Which is why, interestingly, Chinese firms that have aspirations for global brands try to list publicly in Hong Kong or in New York, and many of them do. And because it then gives them the financial discipline of these Western markets. And it also, in terms of branding, you avoid the Huawei problem of that perceived <coughs> opacity because you're publicly traded in New York. You have to do these annual reports, which people tend to accept. Okay. Um, we hear a lot in the news about um, uh, intellectual property theft, uh, corporate espionage done by Chinese companies stealing trade secrets. You know, how, how do we stop that? Is there any way to confront that? Couple, this is a very multifaceted problem. Number one is a lot of the perception about intellectual property theft in China is based on stories we remember from the 1990s or 2000s about the massive counterfeit markets and about the very widespread intellectual property theft going on in China. If you ask an intellectual property lawyer about what's going on in China, their laws are now more stringent than those in the United States. They have dedicated intellectual property courts in which if your intellectual property is infringed upon or stolen, you can sue. And indeed, when foreign firms sue Chinese, they win the vast majority of the time. And you don't forget it, it's in the 70s or the 80%, but they win most of the time. And foreign uh, complainants tend to receive higher payouts than Chinese firms do when they sue one another. So it has moved massively beyond the intellectual property free-for-all that was once perceived. At the same time, the problem with a lot of the trade negotiation discussion of IP theft and espionage is it is based on a feeling, or a sense, or anecdote. If you actually read the government reports, they don't cite statistics, they cite this is going on, without providing specific detail. This is a problem because it makes it very difficult to say when the problem has been resolved, since you do not have a benchmark of what the current problem actually is or where it stands. So the situation in China is that many firms have given up the old intellectual property theft approach because they have intellectual property. They want to protect it as well. They want it mutually recognized in foreign markets. And further, companies like, for example, Huawei, want to be able to export. If they want to export into Europe, they need to recognize the patents of European companies. So just in the last two years, they entered a massive licensing agreement with Nokia to give them access to Nokia's patents, because otherwise, of course, they're still using that technology. But without a license, that's infringement. So they now have licensed it in order to legalize their operations. So as Chinese firms follow the go out strategy, they have no choice but to get right with intellectual property. And indeed, that's exactly what many of them are doing. Um, along those same lines, um, there's been a lot of talk about the defense industries and being able to reverse engineer, they're able to get a hold of like, some of that still going on in China, particularly maybe sensitive technologies. In the same way that um, if you, any country, the defense industry, one of their big things is trying to acquire foreign technology and rip it apart and find out how it works. This is what defense industries do. Further, in the modern era of digital technology, everything is a dual use technology because everything relates to defense in one way or another. So. I can't really speak to the strategic aspects of this, but suffice to say that any technology can be construed as a dual-use technology, which can be reverse engineered. Okay. Do you feel that China will surpass the U.S. in technology, especially robotics, and could the issue of stealing technology actually reverse? <laughs> there are those who would actually argue that um, the Snowden, revolution, uh, Snowden revelations about US domestic spying and foreign spying actually say that the US is already doing this anyway, trying to steal everybody else's technology. I disagree with that assessment, because again, it's based on anecdote and feeling rather than hard fact. But the perception is that everybody steals from everybody else, at least in politics. What I would say is there, China does have very sophisticated automation technology, and they're working very aggressively at promoting development of AI, artificial intelligence, and the applications for that technology. The United States is as well. Our advantages lie in different areas, so it's going to be a robust global competition, as well it should be, because countries do better when they face competition. Companies com perform better when they are competed against. And so I would say, is China destined to beat if that means anything, the United States in these technologies, there's no guarantee of that. 
because we don't know if next year at Stanford they have a breakthrough in quantum computing, all of a sudden all bets are off in terms of the technology trajectory we've been on. We don't know. So with technology, you don't want to bet on projections into the future. I always tell my students, the worst thing you can ever do is look at what's happened in the last five years and draw a line of dots. That's never a good bet on what's going to happen in the future. Um, impact of 27 million jobs due to the steel and aluminum tariffs, 430 million job losses in collective economy. Have job losses been experienced elsewhere due to tariffs in other sectors? And how does this situation relate to the lower unemployment stats that are being reported by the media? So on the whole, even if the workers at mid, uh, Midcontinent Steel lose their job, the economy on the whole is doing extremely well right now. We've been riding a spectacular run of growth for the last 10 years. President Trump, to his credit, has continued that run of growth. It's actually, you know, many liberals said it was going to collapse, cuts it to go up. It's been a nice, steady progression over the last decade. Very good. Meaning, even if you lose your job due to the tariffs, there is demand in the economy for workers. So this is why we're approaching the equivalent of full employment. Now again, we always have to remember the employment statistics are based on an assumption of, are you actively looking for work? So someone who has decided, I'm never gonna work again, I'm just going to not look for a job, they're not unemployed. They're just not working. So there is still some of that, what they call the underemployment in the economy or the discouraged workers, one of the reasons why you've seen some fluctuation in recent months, even as the overall economy's been doing great, wait a minute, why did the, the rate go from 4.6 to 4.7? How did it tick up? Well, some of those discouraged workers finally decided, you know what? There are jobs in the economy, I'm going to start looking. The moment they start looking, then they're suddenly unemployed again, the, as long as they're looking for a job. So on the whole, the net economic impact has been minor. <laughs> but again, if you had a good paying uh, job at Midcontinent Mail and now you're working at Dollar General, you might still perceive this, yes, I'm employed, but it's been a step down significantly. So the question is not, are there enough jobs? There's more than enough work. The question is, how well do these jobs pay, and are they the types of jobs that workers want to have? That's a separate issue. Okay, this is gonna be our last question. Okay. What is the issue with China manipulating their currency? So up, until, so up until 1993, China actually had an overvalued currency. It was pegged at about three to the dollar, three Chinese renminbi to one US dollar, which, given the state of China's economy, was actually massively overvaluing the currency. In 1993, they devalued the currency, pegging it at about 8.1 to the dollar, and there it remained until 2006, at a stable peg rate. By 2006, the economy, as you saw in the chart, had grown so much that the government began realizing that they needed to start allowing some flexibility in it. So they began entering a more managed float of the economy, allowing some degree of fluctuation in the amount, and it came down. So it went from 8.1 to the mid-60s by, uh, by the time about five years ago. Since then, it has crept back up slightly. But one of the reasons it's crept back up has actually been because of weakness in the Chinese economy vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. economy. Our economy is doing extremely well, which increases the value of the dollar. A more valuable dollar naturally is going to make the Chinese currency, in relative terms, less valuable. So while there is still management of the currency, holding it down as an artificially low value actually hurts China in many ways, particularly because China is a major oil importer. All that oil that comes in, if they maintain an artificially low exchange rate, they're paying that much more for all of those critical imports. Similarly, even if you're a manufacturer, let's say you're Foxconn, yes, that low exchange rate benefits your exports, but all of those 85% of content that you have to bring in becomes more expensive, further constraining your profit margins. So there's, it's a much more complicated story than just holding down the artificially holding down the value of the currency. But suffice to say, it is still a partially managed flow. It is not a freely floating currency. Well, with that, thank you very much. Thank you.